There are several kinds of insects that can develop as a borer inside a plant. We've discussed some of the ones that are in the order Coleoptera that are beetles that develop as wood borers, but there's others as well. Uh, most importantly, we find these in the uh, order Lepidoptera. Uh, certain kinds of moths have larvae that develop as a wood borer, carpenter worms, clear wing borers, and a group I'll call the pyralid borers. There's also one pretty important family of wood boring wasps uh, in the order Hymenoptera, the horn tails, or sometimes they're called wood wasps. But of these other families of, of insects, the most important in terms of tr tree health or, or plant health uh, are clearwing borers because some of them are, are fairly aggressive under certain circumstances, uh, meaning they can do extensive damage even to fairly healthy plants. Now the name uh, clearwing borer uh, is derived from the appearance of the adult form. The adult moths in this family all fly during the day and all have the appearance of some sort of stinging insect, usually a wasp. Uh, and to achieve this appearance, they often will have areas of the wing which are absent scales. Uh, moths have wings that are covered with scales, and clearing borers have areas of the wings that are absent these scales, making the appearance of a wasp uh, a little bit more uh, uh, convincing. The common clearing borers in this region include some uh, fairly important species, probably the most damaging of the uh, clearing borers in, in the region is peach tree borer, which is associated with prunus, the stone fruits, be they ornamental plants or uh, plants that are being grown for tree fruit production, such as peaches, uh, plums, and cherries. Lilac ash borer is also quite common. Uh, because of its association with ash, which is a common street tree. Uh, and, and then we have uh, various other ones, current borer, viburnum borer, raspberry crown borer, and cottonwood crown borer, probably being the most important uh, other species in this family that are associated with trees and shrubs in, in this part of the country. The larvae of a clearing borer are going to make a kind of pattern that is is not really definable in an easy way because they will feed on, on various kinds of tissues uh, on the outside of the of the cambium gouging it and then sometimes they'll go in uh, many of them can find their feeding to the parts of the plant that are at or even below the, the root zone so uh, many kind of clearwing borer larvae we call crown borers because they develop at the soil crown area or, or below Others feed a little higher up in the plant, but these tend to be all attacking low on the plant. Uh, lilac ash borer, the first one I'll show you, pretty much limits hits to about the first uh, scaffold limbs. Now, when you look at a, a, a borer in a tree, uh, the, the clearing borers superficially kind of look like uh, another kind of borer we just recently discussed, the round-headed borers. So, Two kinds of beetles that were discussed uh, last time were the flat-headed borer, and that's a pretty distinctive kind of insect because it's got that flattened body and the flattened area behind the head. But the round-headed borers have a general body form that is similar to that of a clearing borer. So how do you tell what kind of wood borer you have among these two? Well, remember, uh, in the order of Lepidoptera, a defining feature of the larvae is they have prolegs. The, these are those uh, uh, leg-like structures that uh, are found on the abdomen and they are tipped with little hooks, hooks in different patterns, a circle, a, 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 a hemi a circle, or, or um, various kinds of patterns. Uh, and and on, on a caterpillar that develops on the leaves, uh, these are usually quite pronounced. Well, all Lepidoptera larvae have prolegs but the ones that develop in trees and shrubs and within plants uh, are going to have prolegs that are very reduced, but what remains are the crotchets, those little hooks at the end of the, the uh, uh, prolegs. So you will see if you flip one of these larvae over, and, and I think the picture on the lower right shows this, uh, these, these paired prolegs that are tipped with hooks, they don't extend much off the abdomen, but they still have the hooks there presence of those hooks and those pairs on the abdomen, that's a Lepidoptera larva. Without that, it's a Coleoptera larva. A 
beetle larva. Uh, so once again, uh, in the peach tree borer, the larval pictures we have on the left here, on the top, you know, fairly typical, it could be a round head borer, could be a, a, a clearing borer larva, flip it over and there are those pro legs. Uh, another example on the right of a different kind of borer that we'll talk about after the clearing borers, you can see the, they've got very short pro legs, in this case the hooks they have are in a, a little circular pattern that tip the pro legs, the Zeroon pine moth example here. Now, probably the most commonly encountered one for many people would be the lilac ash borer. This is a common insect on, on ash trees. Uh, it is associated with other kinds of plants. Uh, it's known as the lilac ash borer and, and it elsewhere will damage common lilac, privet, uh, but it's mostly a problem here on ash and particularly ash that are uh, newly established that haven't uh, got a, a high level of of resistance developed yet. They're struggling a bit. Uh, they're in a site that is maybe, maybe some, uh, sort of marginal like a parking lot or street tree, uh, but uh, they, they can extensively damage trees in, the, in these sites and it is a common insect. The type of injury uh, of this insect and of other kinds of clearing borer larvae is a irregular gouging some of the at attacks are, are just underneath the bark and they're just ripping out tissues uh, uh, there and then they may tunnel in. So it's kind of a mixture of, of feeding sites and, and patterns. So this picture here shows a, 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 a an ash tree that was brought in and it had fallen about at the soil line and the, the base of the tree is on the, on the right. And you can see what it looks like on the outside but what we want to look at on the inside is is a uh, more extensive general riddling. Again, some of the activity was on the outside, gouging just into the bark, but it also extends internally. So maybe kind of a mixture of what we see with a rounded bore and a flat-headed bore, uh, both, uh, but no no real regular pattern. However, most of the activity is associated with the base of the, the plant. Now. These are caterpillars that are going to turn into a moth. And so what will happen that's different between these and a beetle is that the caterpillar, when it has finished feeding, it sets up uh, just underneath the bark, leaves a very thin window. The larvae chews, leaves a very thin window, and then it will pupate there. And this habit is different because the adult form of these kinds of insects are moths and moths can't chew. The caterpillars can chew, the moth can't chew. So they pupate just a bit underneath the bark and have just a little window through which the adults can subsequently wriggle out, uh, pop through and wriggle out. So the chewing has to be done by the larvae because the adults are not going to be able to chew. Now the pupa that is just underneath the bark uh, will uh, kind of be often worked out through that opening as the adult emerges. And what we see here are multiple uh, pupil skins, if you will, the, the the old pupil coverings of the insect that had earlier been developing underneath the bark, wriggled out to emerge and then emerge as its adult form. So often we will see with moth larvae that develop as borers are uh, pupil skins that are extruding from the plant or at the base of the plant. Uh, uh, these are not things we would see with a beetle type of borer as well. So we're going to see an exit hole made by an adult moth that may be oval, nearly round, but kind of irregular. It's, it's, uh, it was made in the larval stage underneath the bark and then the adult kind of pushed through uh, what uh, had been left behind uh, to cover it well, it was a pupa, and it was just a thin layer, and then they just pop right through. In the case of the lilac ash borer, the adult forms more or less look like a, a paper wasp, I think. Uh, and these are one of the very earliest kinds of borers that emerge during the year. You can sometimes see them out and about in late April. It needs to be 60, 65 degrees, sunny, calm day, 
uh, and you might get some out in, in late April, but most of these are coming out in sometime in May and then through through uh, June. The next uh, clearing bore that is quite important regionally is the peach tree bore, the one that's already come up for discussion because of its importance in peach and plum and cherry and, and some of the fruit crops in the previous section of this class. Uh, peach tree borer larvae feed at the crown area. You will not see these up uh, on the lower trunk. You'll see all the activity at or just below soil line. So these are true crown borers. And peach crown borer is another name that is sometimes applied to this. Uh, pupation occurs within a cocoon covered with little bits of wood chips. It's, it's produced just below the soil line. And this picture in the upper right shows that cocoon. Uh, it's, it, it may be a little difficult to understand this picture because of its orientation. So this is on its side, but if you were to flip it uh, clockwise uh, 90 degrees, it would be how it appeared uh, when it was brought in. And the soil line is pretty much just at where the uh, cocoon has has uh, been established uh, on this plant. The moth, when it emerges, will pull out that pupil skin. You might see the pupil skins. In this case, they would be right around the base of the plant. And this one's going to come out more or less uh, late, very late spring, early summer, 4th of July. A couple weeks, a couple, three, four weeks uh, on either side of that. Uh, in this case, uh, we have an insect that shows some pretty good sexual dimorphism uh, between the female and the male. Female on the left uh, is got a bright orange band and has quite dark wings. The male is going to be uh, fairly different in its appearance and has much clearer wings. But uh, when they're out and about, if they find each other, they will mate and then the female will subsequently lay their eggs, her eggs, uh, on the bark as all these clearing borers do. In this case, the eggs would be laid on the, on the bark right near the base of the plant. So the eggs of these insects are laid external on the plant. They're not inserted uh, and uh, usually near the base of the plant. Now, there are some others that we have talked about before. Uh, again, in, in the tree fruit and small fruit section in the previous class, current borer, on ribes, this would be the most common uh, one of the clearing borers you might see in that plant. The adults usually emerge in early June. They might be seen mating on the leaves. Uh, and if you look at the base of the plant, you might see that extruded pupil skin from which those adults had, had emerged. The eggs are laid on the surface of stems, as are all clearing borers. At hatch, the larvae tunnel into the stem. They go uh, through the uh, interior of the stem, extending a tunnel of a foot or more in length. This internal uh, damage, particularly as the larvae get bigger, more extensive damage is done, and this can cause a weakening of the, the, the uh, twigs or the, the branches that will allow the uh, plant to often break, uh, makes them quite prone to breaking. Mature larvae then t tunnel downward and at the base of the plant is where they're going to spend winter. So you'll see them really all the way down into the, the crown area to get through the winter. And then another one would be raspberry crown borer. This is a, an insect that's found on raspberries. The larvae develop at the base of the plant. The adult, in this case, looks more or less like a yellow jacket, a type of stinging insect. So if we have clearing borers, the kind of injury we're going to see is a tunneling, often concentrated at the base, the root crown area of the plant, but certainly in the, in the lower trunk or uh, the base of the plant, including the root system. They do not make a tunneling pattern that is as clearly distinctive as the flat-headed borers or a round-headed borer. It's a regular gouging, and some of it is just under the bark, and some of it is a little more in, uh, deeply in, uh, affecting the interior part of the plant. And then you may see pupil skins with these and other Lepidoptera. Uh, the pupil skin is often pulled partially from the plant as the insect emerges, uh, which may provide a diagnostic uh, sign that you can see and, and help you diagnose what has happened on that plant. 
So let's move on to some of the uh, more minor, if you will, uh, although they're important on their host plants, uh, kinds of borer groups. The group I call pyralid borers, or I, give, I give them that name because they're in the family pyralidae within the order Lepidoptera, include a couple of insects that develop in conifers, particularly pines. And there are two species that are particularly common in this part of the country, the Zimmerman pine moth and the pinion pitchmast borer. Again, these kinds of insects are going to be showing the evidence of, of being a, a Lepidoptera larva. Uh, so I have the picture of the peach tree borer larva on the left that I showed earlier. The one on the right is the Zimmerman pine moth. So these are going to be caterpillars that develop within a tree and they will have pro legs and those legs will be tipped with some sort of hooks, the uh, uh, crotchets, the crochets, excuse me, on the tip of the pro legs. The Zimmerman pine moth is probably the more important of the the ones we have in the area. Uh, this develops on a wide variety of pines, but particularly like some of the introduced pines, such as Austrian pine. The uh, pinion pitchmast borer is going to be associated with pinion, but it also is found on, on ponderosas as well. Uh, the pinion pitchmast borer makes a very kind of uh, usually at its site you get a, a, a kind of creamy or pinkish kind of ooze at the site. The uh, Zimmerman pine moth you would tend to get more of a, uh, a crunchy, uh, creamy uh, kind of ooze associated with the wound site. But both of these insects, both the Zimmerman pine moth and the pinion pitch mass borer, make rough gouging wounds. They will often make them near the crotches of branches uh, and this can cause a, a progressive weakening of the limb you, so you might see the limbs subject to breakage. So if we have a pyralid bore kind of injury uh, it's going to be on a pine and the tunneling produces an irregular gouging often concentrated at crotches of, of branches uh, often right next to the trunk and again lots of this wounding time and time again uh, creates considerable weakening at that limb junction. A whitish pitch is produced at the wound. Uh, if it's soft and pink, uh, it's often pinion pitch mass bore. Uh, the, uh, the crusty popcorn-like material is often associated with the Zimmerman pine moth. And then one last group of caterpillars that develop as borers are the carpenter worms. Uh, these are most common when you get out east on the plains. Uh, the carpenter worms are very large caterpillars. Uh, they are much larger than the other kinds of borers we're talking about on, on trees and shrubs. And the moth is quite a large grayish moth that is rarely observed. These are associated primarily with uh, common plants in shelter belts, so deciduous trees and shrubs that are found in shelter belts in the eastern plains. So it could be uh, ash, it could be cottonwoods, it could be uh, maples, um, but a wide host range. Uh, the most common one of this family is the carpenter worm, which is strictly in deciduous trees. There's one that is found along the foothills that is associated with just populace, uh, including aspen, uh, but mostly it's the carpenter worm and it makes very large uh, uh, tunnels within the trees. And then finally, there is the family of wood boring wasps we call the horn tails. Uh, these are a, a family of, of wasps that often have a projection off the hind end uh, that houses the uh, ovipositor that is used by the female. The ovipositor is the, the ovipositor being the structure used to lay eggs. The ovipositor is used to drill into the plant and insert eggs underneath the bark. Uh, often the eggs will be associated with a fungus as well and these wood boring wasps usually introduce a kind of white rot fungus in association with egg laying and the white rot fungus will help decay the area around where the young horntail larva is going to develop which makes it more suitable as a site for the larvae to develop. The most common of the wood boring 
the wasp that one will see in this part of the world is, is the pigeon tree mix, which is the only member of this family that is associated with deciduous trees. If you get into forest settings, you have uh, several kinds of, of wood boring wasp that come into dead or recently felled um, trees, uh, notably pines. But pigeon tree mix is one that you're going to find fairly common in yards, gardens. Uh, it is a wood boring wasp that is associated only with trees that have some issue that are in decline, uh, that are just about to die. They're still alive, but just about to die uh, another few years, and they will probably hasten the demise of those plants, not only through uh, the tunneling by the larvae, but probably more importantly by that fungus that is introduced in the course of egg laying that the horn tails will, will produce as they uh, in introduced in the course of egg laying. The horn tail larva, as it develops, will look kind of like a, another other kinds of wood boring uh, insects. They do not have pro legs. The head is not as strong and, and heavily sclerotized as that of a rounded boar, say. They will tunnel internally within the plant and when they do emerge, when the adult form emerges, it can chew its way out, as can beetles, and the hole that it will emerge from is perfectly round. So let's talk about how we might manage wood borers. Uh, there are a couple of, of general principles. Uh, one of them is to optimize conditions for plant growth because many borers uh, cannot survive well or thrive in a tree that is, is growing well. Trees have ways to defend themselves and these may be uh, sufficient if the tree is, is sited well and is growing well because conditions are optimal for its growth. It's not always the case, but often is. There are some sanitation practices that can assist with wood borer management, uh, certain kinds of pruning practice in particular, and there are ways we can use insecticides, but they have to be used in a preventive manner. So the whole issue of plant health care and wood borer prevention is, is quite important and, and fundamental. Uh, again, there are many kinds of borers that you will not see a problem with if the tree is, is growing in, in a good site and uh, has been able to uh, develop good energy reserves. Um, that's not always true. There are some aggressive bores that we have, but in general this will uh, be the first step to uh, reduce the attacks of any kind of bore and in many cases it may completely prevent them from becoming a, a serious problem. So we're talking about things like you know making sure you select a plant material that is appropriate for the site put it in the right place, prepare the site well so the roots can uh, establish uh, uh, well on the site, uh, so good planting conditions. But the most important thing in terms of wood borer prevention is that it has to be adequately hydrated. So available water is going to be most important in the ability of a tree to resist attack by almost any kind of borer. And sometimes we can uh, modify conditions so that they they do become uh, far less susceptible to wood borer attacks if we give attention to th this adequate watering or soil moisture available to the root system. And, and the best documented example of this would be a flat-headed borer that develops in birch trees called the bronze birch borer. Now this can be a devastating insect on, on several kinds of white birch that are planted in a front yard setting. In the forest, where bronze birch borer and birch normally occur, this is not a serious problem. Uh, but when you put it in a front yard, it is. And a large part of that has to do with the uh, stresses that occur on the plant when you put it in that kind of site. Most importantly, the available water uh, getting into the birch tree becomes very uh, irregular and uh, fluctuates a lot. Usually the tree is competing with grasses, uh, lawn grasses for the for available water. It's in a, a sunny site, it's not in a forest, uh, so it's more exposed and losing water more readily. And one way that these trees can be made much more resistant to uh, susceptible, uh, much more resistant to attacks by this insect are to uh, have a, a broad area underneath the plant that is free from competing plant roots. 
mulch out to pretty much the uh, trip line of the tree. So you have a, a large area through which the roots of this tree can pull water. The, uh, the mulch modifies the available moisture and again you're not having the competing uh, problems with, with say turf grass uh, picking up moisture. In this case you can often completely eliminate problems or serious problems anyways with bronze birch borer if you give the tree more of an opportunity to help resist attacks by providing more even watering. There are some reasons why wood borers and stress plants come together. Uh, plant defense responses are diminished uh, and these these are plants that usually have some ability to resist the attack of an invading organism including a borer uh, and these plant defenses are related to uh, stored photosynthate, essentially stored energy that they have and available water. If they have uh, high energy reserves in the roots and good water availability they can often ward off an attack by an invading borer. Also, some plants may be more attractive to adults of the wood borers uh, as they seek hosts to lay their eggs on. They can make distinctions between various plants that might have differences in their ability to resist attack, that might have different stress levels, and the females will oviposit, lay eggs more readily on plants that have some sort of chemical profiles coming off them that indicate they're under stress. Sanitation and wood borers have some uh, applications. Uh, one of the things that would be important here would be to eliminate potential, uh, potential brood wood. And borers, uh, particularly those that have some association with stress, are going to be developing in tissues that have some associated stress, such as a, a wounded limb or a overshaded limb. And if these uh, parts of the plant are regularly removed through pruning, which would be standard practice uh, for uh, maintaining health of, of trees anyway, uh, you are going to get rid of the kind of wood on a plant that would more likely allow the larvae of a wood borer to develop. So they can't build up their numbers. A good pruning regimen will, will help uh, eliminate the sites on a tree where wood borers might establish and build their numbers. And if you can find uh, infested uh, material on a, on a plant of, of, of interest, then they should be pruned out, pruned out uh, before the uh, insects emerge. Now this is pretty much only going to be of use if you have some sort of multi-stem shrub, uh, but sometimes you can notice, uh, particularly during the winter time, that there are areas on the shrub that indicate that they have had some issue with borers. Uh, in the picture on the lower right we can see a little uh, raised area on the the uh, cane there on this ribes and that indicates a, a previous attack by in this case a kind of flat-headed borer. Canes that show evidence of attack uh, that might have developing stages of larvae should be pruned out before the adults of that species come out. Usually they're going to come out sometime in May or June you have to cut them out and then you have to destroy them or, or remove them from the site because uh, if you have developing stages of a boar in a cane, in a limb, they can usually complete their development within that limb after it's been pruned from the plant. So proper disposal of pruned wood is important. And then there's the use of insecticides. And for almost all wood borer situations, we are talking about a preventive use of insecticides. So in this picture on the right, we see uh, poplar borer larvae uh, in various stages, adults, mostly larvae, we see um, uh, pupae, but we see an insect that is already within the tree. And, and treatments are not available for borers that are already within the plant. However, almost all wood borers have a one-year life cycle so that at the end of a year the adult form will be emerging from that plant, the adults will be walking on the surface of the plant, mating on the surface of the plant, maybe feeding on the leaves of that plant, and then laying eggs on or maybe just underneath the bark. Uh, and at that point they become uh, quite vulnerable. So when we're using preventive 
in, in, insecticides in a preventive manner, uh, what we're usually talking about is a timed spray that would coincide with the egg laying, egg hatch period of that insect. When they're out and about, vulnerable, uh, exposed, uh, they can be readily controlled with several kinds of insecticides applied to the bark that would kill them uh, during this period of activity. So when does this occur? Uh, well, uh, if you saw the adult insect around uh, the, and, and you knew what it was, that would tell you the adults are out and about. Egg laying, egg hatch is associated with adult activity. But that's usually a stage that most people are going to have difficulty observing and you, unless you spend a lot of time looking for them. Uh, maybe if the boar had just recently emerged and there was some fresh exit hole and you noticed uh, that it was new and it hadn't been there a few days ago, that would tell you the adults are out and about and that is going to be associated with uh, subsequent egg laying and egg hatch. If you had a clear wing boar, uh, if you were to see those extruded pupil skins, or that would that would tell you the adults have just recently emerged within the last couple three weeks. However, for most boars, what we need to do is estimate their flight period, and there are a couple guides for you to be able to make these estimations. Uh, one of these is in the fact sheet we have on shade tree boars, or it is also in bulletin 506A. Uh, there is a table in these two publications that uh, allow you to figure out what kind of boar you have in the tree and then it provides you information on when they fly. So the first thing you need to know is what kind of tree we're talking about. Is it a pine? Is it a spruce? Is it a ash tree? Is it a honey locust tree? And also, what kind of boar we have? Is it a metallic wood boar? Is it a horn tail? Is it a clear wing boar? If we know those two pieces of information, what kind of boar it is and what kind of plant it's associated with, these tables can almost always allow you to identify what boar you have. And the final column on the right in this picture right here shows when they fly. So if we're talking about the flat-headed apple tree boar, that's one that is flying June through August. If we have a um, the locust boar, a longhorn beetle, uh, that's a very late flyer. So that's one that comes out in August and is flying in September, laying its eggs late in the season. Anyway, two pieces of information you need, what type of plant it's coming out of, and then what type of boar, what family of boars. Uh, and we've talked about several of these families of boars. And if you can put those together, you can use these tables to figure out what you have and then when they fly. Now, the kinds of products that are generally used for wood borers are sprays. There are three active ingredients that are used as borer sprays. Presently, the most commonly used product is a pyrethroid insecticide known as permethrin. That is also the most available one over the counter for homeowner use. Carborolin 7 has been historically a product that has been widely used for wood borers, but has largely been supplanted. Uh, by the pyrethroids such as permethrin. Another product that is used quite extensively uh, is bifenthrin, a pyrethroid that has no over-the-counter products that are available for wood bore control but is sold to uh, commercial applicators under trade names most notably Onyx. And then finally there are some applications where we can use systemic insecticides particularly a metacloprid. Uh, however, uh, this is only effective against one kind of wood boring insect. But anyway, I'll get to that in a second, but the, the most commonly available treatments are, are some sort of spray put on the trunk to coincide with the period when the adult is out and about. The only product I can find that contains permethrin that I can go to a garden center in Colorado right now that has a label for this is, is shown here, but there are many other products uh, that are widely available and are used by commercial applicators that are essentially the same active ingredient and same formulation. Only one OTC product, OTC by the way means over the counter. And then there's the systemic insecticides. Uh, systemic insecticides are 
uh, in the neonicotinoid class. Imidacloprid is the most commonly available of these. Uh, it does have bores on the label. It's applied as a soil drench to be picked up by the roots. The labels usually say it works on bores. However, it works just on one kind of bore, only flat-headed bores. The monocloprid is not effective against caterpillars, things that turn into moths and butterflies. So clearwing bores, carpenter worms, pyralid bores, uh, these are not susceptible to a monocloprid. Metacloprid is, is mostly going to be found in the cambium tissues and the trunk uh, it, it, where uh, some kind of borers feed and, and the group of borers that do feed there most are flat-headed borers. Metacloprid is effective against beetles and beetles that feed in the cambium such as flat-headed borers are the primary target for these kinds of treatments. Round-headed borers less effective because they spend little time uh, feeding on the cambium they're feeding more internally in the plant. But we are talking about uh, again egg laying egg hatch is what we're trying to target for uh, these kinds of treatments uh, with the sprays. They can be a little bit later if we have uh, a systemic insecticide that can pick up the the young larvae in underneath the bark. But that's the critical piece of information you're always trying to get when you're trying to get a handle on a borer problem. Now there are other treatments that can be used for borers. Uh, several of these have been developed in response to emerald ash borer, which is the subject of the next little uh, talk we have here. Uh, so there are going to be quite extensive use of soil applications of systemic insecticides, as well as trunk injected insecticides for, for this. But that's a special case, and that's what's up next.